In part one and part two of this presentation, we saw how the physical examination can help guide the proper diagnosis of a patient's illness. In part two, we began to look at some of the radiological techniques you'll see and use as a physician. Keep your anatomy atlas available to look up the anatomy mentioned here and answer some of the review questions at the end of the presentation. It will only help reinforce your learning. When you finish this third and later the fourth and last part of the presentation, you'll be well versed in the language of radiology, a language necessary for you to understand as you move forward as a medical student. Here's an example of an arthrogram. It's almost been replaced today by the MRI scan. An arthrogram can be used on just about any joint of the human body. The radiograph is obtained by inserting the needle directly into the bursa and injecting iodinated contrast. That's contrast that's made up of an iodine containing chemical. As you can imagine, it carries the risk of not only being painful, but possibly causing an infection in the joint space. If there is a tear in the joint or bursa, or another injury to the joint, contrast may be seen leaking outside of the joint capsule. The test is most commonly used on the shoulder joint or the knee joint, but it's rarely performed today. MRI imaging of the shoulder and knee has mostly replaced arthrography. Prior to the advent of the fiber optic endoscope, a physician was often faced with making a diagnosis of abnormalities affecting the gastrointestinal tract. To view the gastrointestinal tract, we use upper GI series. This study helps the physician Look at the swallowing mechanism, the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum. The patient drinks a dilute barium sulfate solution, flavored to taste like a chocolate or vanilla milkshake, and then under fluoroscopy, remember the Bugs Bunny images when we mention fluoroscopy, multiple images are obtained as the patient swallows the barium sulfate contrast, and we watch it flow through the esophagus, the stomach, and into the intestines. Single still images or a digital movie of the entire process can be obtained. Here on the left we can see the stomach and a portion of the duodenum. On the far right we see an upper GI series with a small bowel follow-through. That's abbreviated SBFT. In the middle image an upper GI is demonstrated with not only the stomach and duodenum being seen but the proximal portions of the small intestine, notably the jejunum. There are several risk factors associated with upper GI series and or small bowel follow-through studies. They are still commonly used today, giving the physician a significant amount of information on the function and pathology of the patient's internal organs, but it often does so at a price. If aspiration of the barium into the lungs occurs, it can cause severe respiratory compromise and even death. Like the bronchogram shown in our next slide, Aspiration of the barium sulfate is usually non-lethal because it is not absorbed and the patient can simply cough it up and out. However, if enough barium is aspirated, it can cause death and respiratory compromise. In addition, barium sulfate, once ingested, can harden like concrete and may become impossible for the body or the physician to remove. Today, these types of studies can be performed with dilute barium sulfate solutions mixed with dilute gastrographin. Gastrographin is a mildly thick, colorless, clear, iodine-containing chemical that is hyperosmolar. While orally or rectally administered gastrographin often results in diarrhea, if it is accidentally aspirated, it can result in significant pulmonary dysfunction and death also. Pulmonary complications are much more common and life-threatening with gastrographin than they are with barium sulfate. The opposite is true in the abdominal cavity. In the abdominal cavity, gastrographin is considered quite safe and barium is considered just the opposite. Keep this in mind in your training. Contrast studies are very commonly used and continue to be used today. They still offer a significant amount of information and often have a therapeutic as well as a diagnostic purpose. For example, a gastrographin enema can cause diarrhea, which may be the intended result if the patient suffers from a colon blockage or severe constipation. You'll see a lot of these studies as you progress through your training. 
Here we see an example of a contrast study of the colon. These are called contrast barium enema examinations. Like the upper GI series with small bowel follow-through, the barium enema exam can be performed with barium and or gastrographin. The contrast examination is performed with either a single column of the contrast material called, not surprisingly, a single contrast barium enema, or photos under fluoroscopy of the colon, partially evacuated of the contrast material, and then re-insufflating the colon with air. This is called a double contrast barium enema. Air, in addition to the contrast material, creates this double contrast. We see that on all of these images. A double contrast barium enema is the type of diagnostic enema most commonly ordered by the physician. Gastrographin is hyperosmolar, contains iodine, and can cause diarrhea. Gastrographin is safe to instill into the colon. However, barium can cause an intense inflammatory reaction within the peritoneal cavity. You'll have to look up peritoneum in your atlas. Therefore, if your patient is under consideration for an operation on the abdomen, it's best to use gastrographin studies rather than barium sulfate as it's easier for the body and safer to evacuate the gastrographin and it will not cause an intense inflammatory response. Even though gastrographin contains iodine, it will not elicit an allergic reaction if a patient claims an allergy to iodine since by giving this chemical into the GI tract, it's not absorbed. It's considered giving it, quote, external, end quote, to the body. Here's an example of a bronchogram. This, again, is an outdated test. The patient inhales dilute barium sulfate in an attempt to visualize the airways and to ascertain whether or not the patient may have an underlying lung cancer or some other pathology. The anatomy of the bronchial tree is shown in the middle photo and on the right a photograph form from the New England Journal of Medicine shows a premorbid photograph of a patient who was drinking dilute barium sulfate for an upper GI series and accidentally aspirated the chemical into his lungs. If you click on the associated link, it will give you the details. The patient died from a severe inflammatory response called a chemical pneumonitis due to the usually innocuous barium sulfate. Note the patient's bronchogram on the left is normal and the patient did survive. On the right, however, the patient's bronchogram was a complication of his upper GI series. That patient died. Remember, these types of studies are not without their risk, and you must be aware of such risks prior to requesting them on your patients. We also use iodinated contrast in the operating room. This radiograph is an example of an intraoperative cholangiogram. The large black arrows on the image on the right shows the left and right hepatic ducts. Go grab your anatomy atlas to look this up. Bile from the liver drains down these ducts and into the common hepatic duct and the common bile duct, eventually draining into the duodenum. The duodenum is the first portion of the small intestine. Use your anatomy atlas to find the left and right hepatic ducts, the common bile duct, and the common hepatic ducts. This contrast material is injected using a plastic catheter placed directly into the bile duct via the cystic duct. Used in the operating room, and contains iodine and a combination of fluoroscopy. This contrast material injected using a plastic catheter placed directly into the bile duct via the cystic duct is used in the operating room and also contains iodine and fluoroscopy is used to obtain these images. To see how the images are obtained, click on the associated links and watch the video. The video is taken from one of my actual patients. It's taken during removal of a gallbladder a procedure called a cholecystectomy. Our technology has become so good, a procedure which is now commonplace allows the physician to insert an endoscope through the patient's mouth, past the esophagus, into the stomach, and finally into the first portion of the duodenum. This procedure is called an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatogram, or ERCP for short. Click on the video link showing how an ERCP is used to retrieve gallstones from a patient's common bile duct. 
An ERCP is a useful test to cannulate the bile ducts for not only removing stones, but for sampling the bile duct if cancer is suspected. Of course, an ERCP is not without its complications. One complication of ERCP is perforation of the duodenum. The large red arrow in the center image shows how a catheter can be placed retrograde into the biliary duct system. Retrograde meaning against the flow of bile. MRI technology allows us to obtain non-invasive images of the bile ducts. Here we see three images of bile duct anatomy obtained using an MR scanner. This is known as an MRCP, Magnetic Resonance Cholangiopancreatogram. As opposed to the intraoperative cholangiogram, which requires a catheter to be placed directly into the common bile duct via the cystic duct, and in contradistinction to the ERCP, an MRCP may only require light sedation if your patient's claustrophobic, as MR scanners are rather tight fit. The first image shows a significantly enlarged bile duct with tortuous hepatic bile ducts. This patient most likely has an obstruction of the common bile duct. The labeled image on the far right shows a stone in the gallbladder and a stone in the common bile duct. This patient will require an ERCP to remove the stone in the bile duct and a cholecystectomy to remove the stone in the gallbladder. The center image, also a MRCP, shows a gallbladder and the common hepatic duct. If you look closely, you can also see the pancreatic duct. Some contrast is also seen in the small intestines. This test, the MRCP, is very useful if your patient is not a candidate for an ERCP or for an operation. A hysterosalpingogram is an invasive gynecological test to assess for causes of infertility. In these images, we see a hysterosalpingogram. Once we understand the anatomy of the cervix, the endometrium of the uterus, and whether the fallopian tubes are patent, open, we can infer causes of a patient's infertility. The middle image shows us a blocked fallopian tube on the patient's left salpinx. Whether it's blocked from cancer, prior surgery, or a congenital malformation is unclear. It simply tells us the patient only has one properly functioning oviduct. A hysterosalpingogram, while still used today, has mostly been replaced by the use of hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy is the use of a fiber optic endoscope inserted into the uterus and eventually into each individual fallopian tube to assess for any underlying abnormalities, i.e. pathology of the reproductive system of the female. Coronary angiography is used almost daily to assess for underlying coronary artery disease by cardiologists all over the country. The coronary arteries supply blood to the heart. In these images, we can see a catheter being inserted either into a femoral artery or one of the arm arteries, i.e. a brachial artery, and the coronary arteries are subsequently cannulated by the catheter. To help you understand some of the anatomy, you should break open your anatomical atlas to learn the names of the coronary arteries. In one image, they'll have been labeled for you. Learn where the left anterior descending artery, LAD, circumflex artery, left main coronary artery, and the left coronary artery are visualized. Please know anatomical atlases will refer to the left anterior descending artery, the LAD, as the anterior interventricular artery. Just like coronary angiograms, we can also obtain an image under fluoroscopy of the vasculature of the brain. This is called a cerebral angiogram. Review the anatomy of the image on the left and see if you can locate those vessels in the radiograph on the right. The middle image is taken from Cyber Anatomy, a program you'll have access to via the Learning Resources Center through A.T. Still Memorial Library. Just like classical angiography, i.e. coronary angiography, we can use an MR scanner to obtain images of the blood vessels. Much like the MR scanner was used to give us an image of the bile ducts, i.e. the MRCP, see slide number 8, we can obtain a magnetic resonance angiogram, or MRA. Here's an example of a cerebral angiogram obtained via the MR scanner. The patient does require intravenous contrast, a chemical called gadolinium, but there is little risk to this procedure. As you can see from this image, compared to the image on the previous slide, 
the MR angiogram can reveal spectacular images and anatomy. Of course, if the MR scanner can give spectacular images of the cerebral vasculature, we would also expect spectacular images in cross-section of the human brain. Here we see sagittal and transverse images of the human brain. Depending on the strength of the magnet, if you'll recall measured in Teslas, we can obtain spectacular images of the human brain in cross-section. As the scanners become better, use stronger magnets, faster computers, and intravenous gadolinium contrast, the images we obtain are truly spectacular and mirror those you'll find in your anatomy atlas. If you want to learn more about MR technology, a link has been provided to you. Please review this 28-minute video. It has information in it you'll need to know and use for the rest of your medical careers. In a previous presentation, we spoke about tomography. In the next slide, slide 15, we'll see how a CT scanner works. However, a simple tomogram is called an intravenous pilogram, abbreviated IVP. An IVP is a tomogram obtained by focusing the X-ray beam at a specific horizontal plane in the body with the patient lying supine. We focus the X-ray beam on the kidneys and bladder, the x-ray source is then moved back and forth rapidly over the patient while focused in one anatomical plane, giving an image of whatever anatomy is present in that single focal plane. Everything outside of the focal plane is blurry and appears outside of focus. That's the desired effect. In the next slide, slide 15, if you watch the video, you'll see an awesome history given to you of the history of the CAT scanner. A CT scanner uses computerized tomograms, hence the name, to provide spectacular images inside the body. A CT scanner and IVP both use radiation, while an MRI image does not use radiation. Here we see a photo of a normal CT scanner. Interestingly, the Beatles, yes, those guys, the rock group, are often given credit for inadvertently providing funding for CT scanner development through their EMI record company. However, this article refutes this and says the Beatles may not have contributed financially to the funding of these initial experiments leading to the development of the CT scanner. It's interesting reading, especially if you're a rock and roll aficionado. If you would like to see a complete body CT scan, click on the other link to view a one minute CT scan of one of my actual patients who had breast cancer. Of course, just like the MR scanner, we can focus the plane of a computerized tomogram machine on any organ or vessel. This tomography allows us to obtain elaborate angiograms. If the CT scan is only focused on reconstructing images of the vasculature, we can command and write the program to do that. The image on the right is a CT angiogram. The vessels are abnormal because rather than being smooth, they're somewhat ratty. Yes, that's what we call it, ratty, and full of plaque. Three examples of tomography, an IVP, a CT scanner, and an MR scanner. Two of the three use radiation, the third doesn't. Let's review what we've learned in this presentation. Here's some review questions. What is an arthrogram? What two joints are most commonly viewed with arthrography? What study has nearly replaced arthrography? What is an upper GI series? What is a small bowel follow-through? What are the complications of barium sulfate? What are the complications of gastrographin? Where is the duodenum located? Where is the jejunum located? What is a double contrast barium enema? How is it performed? What is a single contrast enema? What two contrast materials are used for a double contrast enema of the colon? What is a bronchogram? What substance is used in a bronchogram? What endoscopic technique has replaced bronchography? What is an intraoperative cholangiogram and how is it obtained? What chemical is used to obtain the intraoperative cholangiogram photos? Where is the common bile duct? Where is the common hepatic duct? What is an ERCP and how is it performed? What is an MRCP? What is a hysterosalpingogram? What is hysteroscopy? Where are the common insertion points 
to obtain a coronary angiogram? What are the names of the largest coronary arteries? What is a cerebral angiogram? Where are the vertebral arteries? From what structures do the vertebral arteries arise? You'll use your anatomy atlas for this. What is an MR angiogram? What is a tomogram? Give examples of three studies relying on tomography. What is an intravenous pilogram? How is an IVP obtained? What IV contrast is used during an IVP? Who invented the CT scanner? Explain in brief how a CT scan obtains its images. What is a CT angiogram? How is it obtained? What is an MR scanner? How does an MR scanner work? Compare and contrast that to a CT scan. And who are the Beatles? And why is their history important in the practice of medicine today?